Hello there, and thanks for joining me. I'm digital artist Aaron Rutten, and in this video, I'm going to show you the new features in version 3 of Rebel. The first new feature that we'll look at is support of pen rotation, which is rotating the barrel, and tilt, which is tilting the angle of the pen. And there aren't a whole lot of art applications or pens that can support these functions. I'm using the Wacom Art Pen, which can sense rotation and tilt. The Wacom Pro Pens also support tilt. And there are a couple of Wacom alternatives that also support tilt. As far as I know, Corel Painter was the only application that supported rotation, but now Rebel 3 does as well. So let's go ahead and take a look at how to control that. I'm going to go to my acrylics brush here. I'm going to select a flat brush. A flat brush will rotate very nicely. I'm going to go ahead and just enlarge my brush by holding Control and dragging. And you'll see that on my cursor, I have this line. And if I rotate the barrel of my pen, like I'm rotating it here, then I will rotate that line on the cursor. So if I want to paint like this, I get a thinner line. But if I rotate it, then I can get a thicker line. And if I do it kind of diagonally, then I can get something in between. And I can get these really nice expressive marks now. If you don't have a Wacom Art Pen that senses rotation and your pen supports tilt, then when you're using a pen with tilt, you can tilt the angle of your pen like this, which will change the angle of the mark. So I can still get a very nice expressive mark. And what's nice is I have both of these pens here. When I switch between each pen, Rebel automatically adapts to that pen. Now, if you want to change how the rotation setting works, you can go down to the very bottom left and you can click on the brush creator. That'll pop that up. And then if you look under shape, there is an option for rotation. You can set rotation to none, follow trajectory, pen tilt, or pen rotation. So just to clarify, pen tilt and pen rotation are not separate features. You're either controlling the rotation of the brush with the rotation of your pen or with the tilt of your pen. So any brushes that you want to apply rotation to, you'll have to go in and edit the brush and then add the setting here. Again, this is going to be more noticeable for brushes that are kind of flat to begin with. The next new feature that we'll look at, and probably one of the coolest, is the new Drop Engine. And Drop Engine does an excellent job of simulating dripping paint on the canvas. So you need to do a couple of things. One, you need to select a brush that has fluid media, such as a watercolor brush. I'm using Splat. You want to paint on the canvas. Make sure that there's some water so that it will drip. Then go to your tilt panel here and make sure that this dot is enabled by clicking on it and then drag straight down and that will control the direction of the drips. Now, if you're not seeing any dripping happening, then you may want to add more water. So let's go ahead and add some more water to this brush. We'll pick a different color and we'll paint. Now you can see that the paint is dripping down. And as it starts to get kind of toward the bottom of the canvas here, then it's really going to start to drip. You can see that first drip start to go. There's a second one and a third one. And it's almost like the water is kind of collecting at the bottom. And then it gets so heavy that eventually it breaks through and it just starts to run. And these drips are super realistic. The colors blend together. The drips don't go straight down. They follow the grain of the paper. You can even rotate the canvas if I wanted to rotate it to the side here. I could have my drips go off to the side now if I put down some paint. And now you can see they're going sideways. And I can even use a tablet that has an accelerometer that senses rotation of the screen, such as the Mobile Studio Pro, to rotate my screen and actually drip the paint that way. And that's really awesome. Now, if this wasn't cool enough, you can do even more with this. I'm going to put down some more paint here, some nice green paint. And let's go ahead and select the blow tool here. And now we can actually just pull in the direction that we want our paint to flow. So I'm pulling kind of down and to the left, but now I'm going to go straight up and I'm going to blow that paint straight up. And I'm just going to keep making that same stroke over and over and over again, as if I'm just constantly blowing on it, bringing air across it. Now it's starting to go up. If we want it to go down, we'll go straight down like this, and I will start to kind of pull that paint down. And I'll go back the opposite direction now, start pulling it back the other way, as if I'm just going and blowing across the canvas. Super awesome feature. I, I can't even begin to tell you how cool this is, and you can get some really awesome, really creative, organic looking results with this. And how about I just move my head out of the way so you can actually see what I painted back there. Let's go ahead and switch to another watercolor brush. Let's just try one of these flat ones here. Let's put down a nice big blob of black paint. And we can see it start to drip. Maybe we'll carry it over here so it has its own little area to drip. And I'm going to pull my paper straight down so those drips start to go straight down. 
Now, if you want to go ahead and just kind of freeze time, you can just fast dry in the layers palette, or you can hit F on your keyboard, and that will just instantly dry the paint. Now, if your paint's already dry and you want it to continue dripping again and you want to make it wet, then you just select the water tool here and just paint some water where you want it to drip. And then we can hide the visibility of that water if we don't want to see it here in the layers palette. And you can see that I wet the canvas and now the paint starts running again. Add a little bit more water here and it'll start flowing again. Go ahead and fast dry it to stop that. Now, as I mentioned earlier, these drips run and flow into the canvas that you're working on or the paper that you're working on. And this is because the watercolor engine has been updated to interact more realistically with the papers. So right now we're looking at this default paper here, which is kind of a watercolor paper. Let's go ahead and click on the canvas down here in the bottom of the layers palette, and that'll bring up some other canvas or paper options. Now what you'll notice is a few of these have this little square next to them. This square represents kind of a deckled or rough, uneven edge, and you might see this a lot with handmade paper. The edge of the paper isn't absolutely perfect. Now there's only a few papers here, but you can actually download quite a few more from Rebel's website. Let's go ahead and go with this handmade one here. Click on OK. And now you can see instantly the edges of the paper are nice and worn, the paper texture has changed, and this turns into a completely different kind of paper. I'm gonna go ahead and change the paper again by going to Canvas. Let's try this washi. And now you can see I get a completely different edge. Now what's happening here is the edge isn't actually being cut off, it's just being masked. And what I mean by that is it's being made transparent in these gray areas, but in the white area of the canvas, that's where you'll actually see the paint. Although the paint does flow beyond the edge, you just actually can't see it because it's invisible. That makes it so you can go in here and you can change your papers and you won't lose your paint. So I can go back to Aquarell and you can see that that area of paint that looked like it was trimmed off actually isn't, it's just being concealed. Now one thing to consider is if you were working on one of these papers with the deckled edges, like washi, and you're painting, and then you decide that maybe you don't want those deckled edges, you just want them to be normal and flat again, and you change it back to Aquarell, there may be some messy paint along the edges that you didn't see, and then you'll have to go and clean up those edges. So just keep that in mind. Now these papers look nice and realistic, but they can also add a sense of realism by affecting the way that your paint interacts with that particular canvas or that particular paper. So to do that, we wanna to go to Window, and then Visual Settings. Visual Settings is a new panel. We'll just bring that on over here. And what this does is this controls how your paint is going to interact with the paper or the canvas. Up here at the top, we have Watercolor Behavior, and then we have some presets. So we can choose a preset that matches the kind of paper that we've chosen. And what that will do is that will change all of these sliders here so that the paint will interact in different ways. Maybe the paint is on a rougher canvas, so the paint needs to flow into the texture more. Maybe it's on a smoother canvas and it needs to flow into the texture less. And that's essentially what all this stuff is doing. These first set of sliders here are gonna control the simulation of the fluid going across the canvas or going across the paper. So you can control the absorbency of the paper, the darkening of the edge fringe. You can choose how much of the canvas texture influences the paint. So that's the grain and how the paint flows into that grain. You can choose whether or not you wanna create drips. You can actually disable the drips if you don't like them. Then you can choose the drip size and the drip length. Beneath that, we have these live effects for acrylic paint, which we'll look at in just a bit, and for the canvas as well. These you can change on the fly at any time, and your artwork will update automatically to show you those changes. So I'm gonna go ahead and just delete this stuff on this test layer. Let's go to a watercolor brush. We'll just use liner. So let's look through the presets here. Default is kind of an average setting. Everything's set to five. We go to hot pressed. It's a little less absorbent. There's a little bit less fringe and a little bit less canvas influence. So it's a little bit smoother. If we look at cold pressed, then it's still pretty average with just a little bit less fringe. If we look at rough, then there's a little bit more absorbency and a little bit more canvas influence. And if we look at Japanese, there's not very much fringe at all, a lot of canvas influence, a little bit less absorbency. So they're all very, very similar. If we were to put them all down, let's say Japanese is here, and then default, and then hot pressed, and cold pressed, and rough, you're probably not gonna see a whole lot of difference in the way that they look because they're not very extreme changes, they're very subtle changes but they do help to match that paper texture better depending on what you chose. So if we were using a cold pressed paper, then we would wanna choose cold pressed for the preset. If we're using a rough paper, then we'd choose rough. So let's go ahead and just fast dry this. 
And while we're on rough, let's just increase canvas influence and let's see what that does. Now canvas influence is at 10. And when the canvas influence is set very high, then you can see that the paint really flows in between all of that grain and the canvas. And as the drips start to come down, they hit that grain and it starts to kind of bump the drip around so it's not just a perfectly straight drip. I really love the way that that looks. It's super realistic. Let's go ahead and just fast dry. I'll clear these examples here. Let's turn canvas influence all the way down. We'll do a test stroke. And you can see that these drips are going to react a lot less with the canvas and they'll more or less just go kind of straight down. I'll fast dry that. Now you can feel free to experiment with all these settings to see the different results you can get. I'm not gonna go into too much detail here. These other settings can control stuff like the acrylic paint. So if we switch to the acrylic and then we put down some green paint here and we can control the impasto depth on the fly, which is really awesome. Really cool to be able to see that. I'm gonna select this flat too. Put down a little bit of that, but I'm going to use very light pressure and we can control the texture visibility on the fly as well. So if we want to be able to see more of that canvas texture while we're painting, we can turn it up. If we want to be able to see less, we can turn it down. And then as we're painting, you can kind of get a better feel for what that's doing. You can also choose whether or not you want to show the texture on the paint or not. But with this new visual settings panel, you can really quickly control how your paint's going to interact with your canvas. Let's take a look at the next new feature in Rebel 3, which is the Crop Tool. We can find that under the toolbar here. It gives us these little nodes on the top, bottom, left, and right, and in the corners. And we can simply use these to resize our canvas. It's not going to make the image bigger or smaller, it's going to make the canvas bigger or smaller. So if we're dragging this in, it's essentially like we're using scissors to cut off some of the canvas. If we're dragging it out, then it's essentially like we're gluing more canvas to make the canvas itself larger while the artwork on the canvas stays the same size. So I'll go ahead and just crop this in a bit like so. And then I can either click OK down at the bottom or I can hit Enter on my keyboard to apply that change. And it crops my canvas. Now if I go back to the crop tool and I try to bring some of that back, and I hit Enter, then that paint that I cropped off is gone permanently. So you have to watch out for that. Now just as well, if I'm working on a painting and I paint all the way to the edge of the canvas like so, and then I go to crop and I try to make my canvas bigger, it's not going to automatically add paint over there on the side where I made it bigger because there was no paint there to begin with. So you have to keep an eye on that too. Now, one of the most interesting features of this crop tool is that you can use it along with the deckled edges. So if I go to, let's say, handmade here, and we load that as our canvas, it has those nice rough edges. And if I go ahead and I paint near the edge here on the left and on the right. And then I go to the crop tool and I expand my edges on the left and the right. Hit enter to apply that change. Then it's going to automatically expand the canvas, but I'm still going to get that nice rough edge. However, my paint is cut off again and that's not good. So determining your canvas size is probably something you're gonna to wanna to do at the beginning of the painting process, not near the end. This crop tool is probably gonna work a lot better for cropping if you wanted something to be smaller. So we can go ahead and crop it down like that. And that's the crop tool. The next new feature is masking fluid layers, which is a really awesome new feature. Masking fluid is a solution that you would put on top of your paper and it would keep the paint from going into the paper wherever the masking fluid was applied. Then you'd remove the masking fluid and essentially you just have blank paper underneath. So I can show you that really quick. I have this masking fluid here that says Rebel 3, and I'm turning down the opacity so I can just barely see that. And then I have an influence layer, which is where the paint is going to be applied to. So on that influence layer, if I select the splat brush, and I put down some paint here, then we can see that the paint is not going onto the masking fluid. The masking fluid is keeping the paint from going onto the canvas. It's kind of stenciling it off. Now, if I turn my visibility of my masking fluid layer off, we don't see the masking fluid anymore and we just see the blank paper underneath. Now, of course, the drips are growing over that, so if I wanted to go ahead and back up a step here, make sure that my canvas isn't tilted, turn my visibility back on, and then try that again, and we'll see that the drips won't cover it and the masking fluid will keep the paint off of that area. Let's go ahead and turn the masking fluid layer back on. Let's add in some other colors here. A little bit of red. Hide the masking fluid layer and we can see that it's still keeping the paint off of that area. 
Now, unfortunately, there aren't any default masking fluid brushes. Masking fluid layers are more or less a feature that you can add to any layer. So you can use any brush as a masking fluid brush. Although if you want to completely mask off an area, the brush that you're using for masking fluid has to be 100% opaque. If it's semi-transparent or semi-opaque, then you're going to get a little bit of bleed into that masking fluid area. So fortunately for you, I've made this super easy. I've actually created a few masking fluid brushes, which you can download from patreon.com slash Aaron Rutten. You can import them into Rebel and you can follow along with me. So let's go ahead and start from scratch here. I just have a basic blank layer here. I'm gonna create one more layer. And I'm gonna call that layer masking fluid. And the layer underneath, we'll just call paint. Now we need to do a couple of things here. One is on the paint layer, we need to click this dot icon, and this dot is going to be the target for where the paint is going to go. Then on the masking fluid layer, we need to click the M for masking fluid, and that's going to tell Rebel that that's the masking fluid layer. So we paint masking fluid on the masking fluid layer, we paint regular paint on the paint layer. So on that masking fluid layer, let's go ahead and turn off the M real quick, because we want to be able to put some paint on that layer, and we can't do that until the M is turned off. So I'm going to select a black. That's the best color to use for your masking fluid because it's neutral. And then I'm going to select one of the masking fluid brushes that I created called Masking Fluid Rough. And I'll go ahead and just draw a little design here. This is what we're going to mask off or stencil off. So imagine that this is the area on the paper that's not going to receive any paint at all. Now I want to designate that as the masking fluid by clicking on the M. So all of a sudden that turns from regular paint into masking fluid solution. If we want, we can reduce the opacity of it so that we can just barely see it. We'll click back on the paint layer. Since the paint layer has a dot, we know that we'll be able to add paint to that layer and it's going to be influenced by the masking fluid. So I'll switch to my liner watercolor brush or any watercolor brush. I'll select a color here. I'll go ahead and paint. I'm gonna put down a couple different colors here and you'll see that the masking fluid is keeping the paint from going in that area. If we want to hide the visibility of the masking fluid, we can better see what we're doing. The paint is flowing all around. If we wanted to add some tilt, we could do that, and it could drip a little bit. Now, it will drip onto your masking fluid, depending on how much water is there, but if you wanted that kind of result, you could get that. We could turn off the tilt and fast dry it, and there you go. You get that really nice looking result. Now, in addition to keeping paint off of the canvas, it also kind of inhibits the flow of the paint, so the paint has to flow along the edges of the masking fluid until it eventually kind of builds up and then it, it will drip over if there's drip involved. But you can see the paint kind of collected along the edges of the masking fluid there. Very realistic, very nice effect. Now, if you wanted to go back and edit your masking fluid layer, you can still do that. You just click back on the masking fluid layer, turn off the M, and then just select your masking fluid brush, add to that layer, and then click the M again to turn it back into masking fluid. Go back to your paint. We can select a splat this time, and maybe we'll put in some splattered color here. And pick a better color that we can see. We'll hide our masking fluid, and you can see that that mask has been updated. Although, where I painted over it before, you can still see that. So you can have different layers of masking fluid and different layers of paint on top of each other. Now, if I switch to black and I paint while that masking fluid layer is hidden, it's essentially disabled that masking fluid layer temporarily. So you can't use the masking fluid while it's hidden. That's why you just reduce the opacity. That way you can still paint while seeing it at the same time. Now you can also use more than one masking fluid layer simultaneously and have it take effect on the canvas. So I'm gonna create another layer. I'll just call this MF2 for masking fluid 2. I'll select black. I'll choose a different brush this time. Let's try masking fluid creep. And we'll just paint a little stroke here. We'll go ahead and designate this as a masking fluid layer by clicking the M. We'll reduce the opacity so we can just barely see it. We'll go to that influence layer that we want to paint on. Select red. I'll select the liner. And as I paint, it's now respecting both masking fluid layers. So you can see I'm not able to paint on either of those. If I hide them, you can see the paint flowing around both the masking fluid layers simultaneously. Now we'll move on to the next new feature, and that is improvements to the stencils. Stencils are very similar to the masking fluid in that they can stencil off an area and keep paint from going onto it. 
To get to stencils, we go to Window, and then Stencils. I'll go ahead and just move those right over here. You can choose a stencil. Let's go ahead and try this turtle here. That puts the stencil onto the canvas, and then you can scale it up or down with this button here. You can move it around with this button here. You can rotate it with this button here. And if we go into the sub dialog menu, we have some options here for how we can work with the stencil. What's new in here is the border and the tile feature. Border is going to add a border all the way around the stencil so you can't accidentally paint outside the stencil. So for example, if I select black and I paint, my paint is only staying within the stencil here, kind of the opposite to how it works with the masking fluid. And then if I click on the sub dialog and I remove the stencil, you can see exactly what that did. Do an undo to bring that back. If we try tile, that's the other mode, and tile is going to create a nice tile pattern. So if I scale this down, I can rotate it like this. I can go back to the sub dialog menu. I can unlock the size ratio, and that will let me squish it and squash it. So if I want to make a really wide turtle or a really skinny turtle, I can do that. Go ahead and just scale it down a bit more so there's more turtles. And then we can select something like splat. And we can go in and paint a really nice pattern with all of these stencils. I'll go ahead and just remove that stencil, and we can see exactly what it did. Pretty cool. Now if we go back to the stencils panel, click on the top right sub dialog. There's also a new feature for create stencil from layer image. So that'll create a stencil from the pixels that are on a layer. I'm going to select white. I'll select this masking fluid brush. And we'll just put down some white because white is the effective color for the stencil. I'll explain what I mean by that in just a minute here. Let's go ahead and click on the top right sub dialog in the stencils palette and choose create stencil from layer. Now you'll see that that white that I added is what's going to be the stencil or the area where we're not able to paint. That's kind of reverse from an alpha mask that you'd be used to where white is revealing and black is concealing. In this case, white is concealing and black is revealing. If I select a color, let's say blue, and I select my liner and I start painting in this stencil, and you can see that I'm not able to paint on that area that I defined as white. And then if I remove that stencil, you can see the effect that it had. I'll go ahead and just fast dry so my paint quits flowing there. So you can turn just about any grayscale image into a stencil. Now, as I mentioned, white is concealing and black is revealing, but grayscales or gray colors that are in between black and white will be semi-opaque or semi-transparent in your stencil. And if we look in the stencils palette, here's our stencil that we created. We can give that a name, call it Splat by double clicking on it. The next new feature that we'll take a look at is the addition of the magic wand tool. So I will go ahead and just put down some paint here. Let's use this flat too. And if we wanted to make a selection of this mark, what we can do now is we can go to the magic wand tool, which is found under the selection tools. And underneath that selection tool is the magic wand. Now you may be familiar with the magic wand in other applications like Photoshop. You click on an area of color and it tries to select similar colors surrounding it. You can increase or decrease the tolerance, which will select more or less colors that are similar to that base color that you clicked on. Anti-aliasing means the edge is going to be nice and smooth. Contiguous means it's going to sample colors nearby. And use alpha is going to make sure that it respects transparency. So transparent pixels will create a transparent selection. Opaque pixels will create an opaque selection, and there can be a mix of both. So right now I have anti-aliasing contiguous and use alpha selected. I've gone ahead and I've clicked on this area here. I'll just hide that paint. And on a new layer, I will paint with a different brush here. Let's say liner. And if I paint within that selected area, and then I deselect that selection with control D, you can see that it stayed within that selection and there's that nice transparent edge. So this is a really great magic wand tool. It could be very useful for a lot of things. Let's take a look at the next new feature. To do that, we're going to select the pencil, and we'll select 2B. I'll select a dark gray color. If we do a doodle, you can see that I can freeform draw. But if we hold Shift, we will create a beginning point. And then if I drag out from that point, this is my end point of the line, and I can choose the angle. So wherever your cursor is located, that's where that first point is going to be. So if I wanted to connect a point to the end of this line, I'd hover right over there, hold Shift. There's my first end point drag out to my second endpoint, and then draw a line back to that first point. Same here, I'll hold down Shift, there's my beginning point, drag out to my endpoint, and then just draw back to that point, like so. And again, hold Shift, 
and drag like that. So you get your nice ruler tool anytime you hold shift. This works with pencils and paint brushes. And it also kind of snaps to horizontal and vertical. If you're very careful, that's really nice. But if you want a little bit more control over the ruler, we can open the ruler tool, which is under edit ruler tool. Now the ruler tool gives us three nodes, one for the start point, one for the end point, and one to reposition the ruler. Above the nodes is that guideline, which we'll be drawing on. So now if I draw, it's always going to be on that ruler. And if I move my ruler, then I can very easily draw lines. If I want to change my beginning and end points, I can line those up. And then I can draw my line like so. It works very well. If you don't want the edge to be so perfect and you want it to look a little more irregular in freehand, then you have this panel up here for your ruler. You can turn on freehand mode. We move our ruler and we draw, then you can stray from that line a little bit if you want to. So if I go up and down, you can see I can make it a little bit wobbly. I can lock those control points if I don't want to be able to move them accidentally. So now when I'm drawing, I'm not able to move those lines, but I still get the ruler. And if I'm ready to move it again, I'll unlock it, I can move my ruler elsewhere, and I can draw my straight line. You can also show and hide the ruler by hitting Shift R. That'll toggle it off and on. Now let's move on to the next new feature, which is Perspective Drawing Guides. That's under File, Perspective Tool. In the panel that we have here, we can create a one-point perspective, a two-point perspective, or a three-point perspective. Let's go ahead and start with two-point. So you can see I have my vanishing point here and here, and this is my horizon line. I can, of course, move that if I want my horizon line to be here. And I can begin drawing. If I wanted to draw something like a building like this, and we're standing at the corner of that building, I can hold Shift, and that'll let me draw a straight line across like that. Basically, it's just locking my lines into that perspective. So I'm drawing toward that perspective point. Now I accidentally moved my control point, so what I might want to do is lock my control point so I don't accidentally move them while I'm drawing. Because if you do move it while you're drawing, you'll mess up your whole perspective. You can also turn on freehand mode. That will let you vary your lines a little bit so they're not so perfectly locked into perspective. You can also lock the guides horizontally or not. There's also one point mode. We'll go ahead and turn off freehand and lock control points. Here's our one point perspective. We'll put it right here. We'll draw our horizon line. And then coming out of that point, we'll have some train tracks here like this. And we'll have the different railroad ties going in between. And this is our basic one point perspective. And there you go. We can also try three point perspective. That gets a little bit more complicated. If we hold shift, then these will snap and they'll become perfectly level with each other. Now the three point perspective, you can imagine you're way up on top of a building and you're looking down and that vanishing point down on the ground is your third vanishing point. Or you could do worm's eye view where your vanishing point is up at the top and your other two guides are down here at the bottom and you're looking up at something that is very tall. So we can imagine that this is a building and there's windows and so on. And we're a very short person looking up at that. Go ahead and just turn off our perspective guides there. The next new feature that we'll take a look at is the reference image palette that can be found under Window, Reference Image. And you can simply drag a reference image into the palette from your computer, or you can click on this button to load it. So I'll just load my reference image here from this self-portrait that I created in version two of Rebel. There's my reference image. I can make it bigger and then I can easily draw from that reference image. I can also click on the top right sub dialog and I can change it to grayscale. That's really, really handy. Change it back. If I want to open a different image, I can do that or I can remove it or I can close the palette altogether. I can even take the palette and I can move it over to a separate monitor and then I can make it full screen on that monitor if I want to. To make the image full screen, you just click on this full screen button here and then you can put it back in a window. If you want to show and hide the reference image panel, you can hit control R and we can also have a preview window of our artwork. We can go to Window, Preview, and this gives you a windowed version of your painting. So if you want to see your painting very small while you're working on it up close, you can do that. Or if you want to have a secondary view that's very large and full screen on another monitor, you can do that. You can show and hide the preview panel with Control E, but these two panels can be very handy. And then last but not least, the final feature that we'll take a look at is the new filter menu. If we go to Filter, we can now change the brightness and contrast, the hue and the saturation, color balance, add a color filter, colorize, desaturate, invert, change white to alpha and black to alpha. 
These are all very helpful for when you're painting because now you don't have to go into Photoshop to do this kind of stuff. And all art applications should have at least something like this. So brightness and contrast, if I wanted to brighten up the image or darken it, I could do that. I could increase or decrease the contrast. Or I could go to hue saturation and I can shift the hue if I want to look like a green monster. Or if I wanted to saturate it to make it a little bit brighter. Or if I wanted to make the paint lighter or darker, again, I can do that. Go back to the filter menu, we can do color balance. If I wanted to add a little bit of flavor, let's say a little bit of bluish flavor, I could do that. And this will work on your whole canvas or on individual layers. There's also color filter. So we can add an overall tint over the whole canvas. We can change the color here if we want it to be a different color. If we turn off preserve luminosity, it's more of a multiply tint. If we turn it on, then it's more of an overlay. We can also colorize. If you wanted to kind of make it more monochromatic, let's say I want like a sepia kind of effect here, just turn saturation down and strength up. Now I have a nice sepia effect for my portrait. We can also desaturate it and we have control over the individual channels if we want to kind of balance it out. So what these sliders do is it makes the red more or less dark, the green more or less dark, the blue more or less dark. And we have some other controls here that we can play around with. When we have invert, if we want to turn the image inside out, now the last effect that we'll look at is very useful for people who create line art. I have this example of this skull here, and this is black ink with a white background. So if I create a new layer beneath it, I select pink and I go in and I start painting. You can see that I'm only able to paint on the background, and that's because this skull has black ink that's fused with the background. If I wanted to separate that black ink from the white background, I can now do that. I'll go to that layer, I'll choose filter, and then white to alpha. Now you can see that that white instantly disappears. All I'm left with is the black. So that's a great way to take something that you drew in pencil or ink and scanned, and then separate the ink lines from the white background. So I'm sure there were probably some other things that were tweaked here in Rebel 3, but these are really the major new features. I hope you enjoyed this demonstration. If you did and you'd like me to create more resources for Rebel, such as brushes and tutorials, Go on over to patreon.com slash Aaron Rutten and join my Patreon community for digital artists. I'll put a link down in the video description. If you're new to my channel, I'd love to have you subscribe. I have a lot more videos for digital artists like you. Thanks for watching and I'll see you next time.